Princess Elizabeth has won a special place in the hearts of the people of this country and of the Dominions. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. Hey friend, welcome to my channel Karina Lude where we deep dive and break down the most iconic stars in history. If you're not yet subscribed, please be sure to do so and turn your notifications on so you never miss an upload. Today, unfortunately, we are doing Queen Elizabeth II. There has been a lot of mourning and sadness after the death of Queen Elizabeth II, but there has also been a great deal of celebration. Twitter was in shambles. I could not even log on Twitter for too long because, oh my goodness, it was insanity. But I also learned a lot and it made me curious to know what exactly are the reasons for so many people, even a lot of Brits, a lot of people said it was black Twitter and Irish Twitter, but there were even a lot of Brits I saw giving their commentary and a lot of journalists writing articles and I was learning so much. But we will get into all of that in this video. This video is going to be as unbiased as possible. We are going to focus on Elizabeth the person, Elizabeth the queen, and of course, Towards the end of the video, we will get into all of the controversy that may ruffle a couple feathers and you may learn a lot that you didn't really even know. We are also going to talk about Prince Philip, who mm, he wasn't a good look either. But before we get into that, we're going to talk about her public persona in the media. Queen Elizabeth was portrayed as a beautiful fairy tale queen in the 1950s when she was a young woman and just beginning her career. She was stunning as a young lady also. As she collected more functional clothes, she developed a distinct signature style. Instead of following the latest trends, she dressed for the occasion to stand out in the crowd. She started donning brightly colored overcoats and hats whenever she went out. Five dressers, a seamstress and dressmaker worked on her wardrobes. Elizabeth did not often participate in interviews, so not much was known about her inner life. Not only is it considered impolite to inquire about or reveal the monarch's political beliefs, but she has avoided making any overt statements about her own views in public. Nonetheless, the 1980s saw a heightening of public criticism of the royal family as the public became more aware to the private lives of Elizabeth's children. Her fame reached an all-time low in the 90s after intense scrutiny. She finally started paying income tax and made Buckingham Palace open to the public. Criticism centered on the monarchy's institution and the behavior of Queen's extended family instead of her own behavior and action. So it's not really her that was getting criticism, but those pesky royal children, right? Dissatisfaction with the monarchy peaked with the death of Diana, which I just did a breakdown for the Queen of Hearts. You guys already know how I stand for Queen Diana, okay? I did a breakdown for her on the anniversary of her death and just eight days later, the queen passed away. That is insane. Though Elizabeth's personal popularity as well as general support for the monarchy did have a rebound after her live television broadcast to the world five days after Diana's death. We're going to get into the controversy of that too, why a lot of people don't like her because of Diana. But first, let's get into a little lighthearted fun. Let's talk about her diet. She lives so long, so we are definitely interested in her diet and life habits. Maybe we can take some notes, okay? The queen has been known to have the same jam penny, which is a sandwich for lunch and dinner for as long as she can remember. And she starts each day with Earl Grey tea and a bowl of Special K cereal before moving on to more complex meals like grilled chicken or fish plus a gin cocktail or the occasional chocolate. So she was a heavy drinker. Every once in a while though, for breakfast, the queen did indulge in some scrambled eggs and smoked salmon with grated truffle. And when she dines on her own, she's very disciplined. No starch is the rule, no potatoes, rice, or pasta for dinner. Just usually something like grilled sole with vegetables and salad. Another former palace chef, John Higgins, told the National Post that mangoes were one of the queen's favorite fruits. Ironically enough, that is my favorite fruit. I love mango. The queen really enjoyed mangoes. She could tell you how many mangoes were in the fridge at Buckingham Palace. She drank a glass of champagne every night before bed and her favorite color was blue. Now let's jump into her childhood. So Queen Elizabeth II was born Princess Elizabeth Alexandra Mary on April 21st, 1926 in London to Prince Albert, Duke of York, later known as King George VI and Elizabeth Bowles Leon. A 
April the 21st, 1926, joy bells rang throughout the empire. The Royal Union was blessed. Princess Elizabeth was born. When Elizabeth was born, few predicted she would one day rule Britain as, as its monarch. Elizabeth, also known as Lilibet, was able to enjoy the first decades of her life as a royal without the burden of being the sole heir. Princess Margaret, who is stunning also, and she is on my list before you guys ask, was Elizabeth's only sibling and she entered the world in 1930. They had a governess, which was like a teacher slash nanny, named Marion Crawford, who helped their mother with the two princesses' education at home. Home. Subjects such as music, literature, and history were emphasized in the classroom. The royal family was not pleased with Crawford's 1950 book of the Little Princesses. It was a biography of Elizabeth and Margaret's childhood. Elizabeth orderliness, responsibility, and fondness for horses and dogs are all highlighted in the book. Those sentiments were shared by many, including Winston Churchill, who said that about Elizabeth when she was just two years old. He said, somehow with a distinct personality or attitude, a stereotype, she exudes wisdom and self-reflection beyond her years, which is remarkable for a baby, end quote. A jolly little girl, but fundamentally sensible and well-behaved was how her cousin Margaret Rhodes described her. Elizabeth was third in line to the British throne during her grandfather's reign and after her uncle Edward and her father. Although her birth sparked public interest, Elizabeth was not expected to become queen because Edward was still young and likely to marry and have children of his own who would come before Elizabeth in the line of secession. It was Elizabeth's uncle, King Edward VIII, who succeeded his father, George V, but Edward loved American divorcee Wallace Simpson. She is on my list and she was an interesting character as there's many photos of her with Hitler. So I don't know, but she is on my list and we will get into into it with her in the future. Edward had to choose between his love of Wallace, whether to follow his heart or his country. So Edward eventually made his decision and relinquished the throne in favor of Simpson. As a result of this unexpected turn of events, she is now considered the natural successor to the British throne, which is Elizabeth. In 1937, he was crowned King George VI. He had adopted the name George to maintain a line of secession from his father. And in 1952, after King George the sixth death, Elizabeth's mother became Queen Elizabeth and then Elizabeth II succeeded her as monarch upon her death. In a way, I didn't have an apprenticeship. My father died much too young. It was all a very sudden kind of taking on and making the best job you can. It's a question of maturing in, into something that one's got used to doing and accepting the fact that it's your fate. So if her parents had had a son, he would have been natural successor and would have come before her in the line of succession, which was determined at the time by hereditary rule. Elizabeth joined the Auxiliary Territorial Service to do her part of the, for the war effort in 1945. She learned to be a skilled driver and mechanic alongside other British women. Though her time as a volunteer was brief, it gave Elizabeth a window into the lives of those outside the royal family. When she and Margaret were given the opportunity to celebrate Victory in Europe Day as ordinary citizens without being recognized, it was another one of her most memorable non-royal experiences. Now let's talk about her marriage with Prince Philip, which is an interesting interesting character. So Elizabeth married her distant cousin Philip Mountainbatten on November 20th, 1947 at London's Westminster Abbey. Young Elizabeth was just 13 when she first met Philip and he was, guess what, 18. The Greek prince who would become her husband, she had instant feelings for him as the years passed, the two remained in contact and eventually began dating. How do you remain in contact? You're 18 and you remain in contact with a 13 year old. That's questionable too, but I'll let you guys discuss that in the comments. The royal family and Princess Elizabeth's fiancé have permitted these special film studies to be made in response to the rapidly mounting worldwide interest in the forthcoming royal wedding on the 20th of November in Westminster Abbey. She met Philip Mountbatten when she was just 13 years old on a visit to Dartmouth Naval College. His uncle, Lord Mountbatten, encouraged the match. <laughs> Their wedding later that year lifted the post-war gloom of austerity. And how they cheered the happy pair when they came out onto the balcony. 
they were quite a mismatched pair because while Philip was a loud and extroverted talker, Elizabeth was more reserved and quiet, a shy woman. Although British authorities had connections to the Danish and Greek royal families, King George VI, Elizabeth's father, was hesitant to approve of the marriage because of rumors that he was a tyrant and that the fact that Philip also was not wealthy. He didn't have much money. Although her mother and Prime Minister Winston Churchill strongly supported changing the family's surname to Windsor, the decision was met with resistance from the Queen's husband who wanted the Queen to take on his last name. So it was kind of like a blow to him that he basically had to take on her last name. That could have been a blow to his ego. I don't know. In 1960, she mandated that her non-royal descendants use the surname Mountbatten Windsor for official purposes such as marriage. So Philip's impulsive controversial comments and rumors of possible infidelity caused countless public relation nightmares over the years and we're going to get into that. But Elizabeth and Philip didn't wait around to start a family. Their firstborn son Charles was born the year after they tied the knot by crowning Charles Prince of Wales in 1969, she effectively anointed him to succeed her. On television, hundreds of millions of people watched the event. Now let's get into Prince Philip's affairs. A musical comedy superstar Pat Kirkwood earned more than any other actress in London at the time. While Elizabeth was at home in her eighth month of pregnancy with Charles, Philip and Pat went out to eat in London publicly, might I add, and then danced until dawn at nightclub. They supposedly exchanged letters and met six more times, allegedly. Pat's career was derailed by the rumors that she was the prince's mistress. The protocol of the royal palace meant that they would not issue a statement responding to the rumors, leaving Pat to defend herself on her own. I would have had a happier and easier life if Prince Philip, instead of coming uninvited to my dressing room, had gone home to his pregnant wife on the night in question." End quote. To pre Helen Corbet, a Greek cabaret star and lifelong friend of Philip, was also rumored to be the prince's lover. She had two children, Max and Louise, while separated from her husband, and she concealed their paternity. They had Prince Philip as their godfather, and he helped pay for the son Max tuition so many people assumed and speculated that her children were his biological kids. Helen denied the affair and Max the son publicly addressed the rumors that Philip was his father in 1996 saying that no he is not my father but never stated who was. TV host Katie Boyle, actress Merle Oberon, actress Anna Massey, and author Daphne du Maurier are all alleged exes of Philip. It was known that Philip would go on these long trips away from her and they wouldn't even hear each other and it'd be like a bachelor getaway. Philip did pass away on April 9th, 2021 at age 99. So he lived a pretty long life too. Now let's talk about her coronation. So Queen Elizabeth II was crowned on June 2nd, 1953 at the age of 25 at Westminster Abbey. When her father, King George VI passed away on February 6th, 1952, Elizabeth became monarch. For the first time, the glamour and series of events of the coronation ceremony was seen by people all over the world thanks to television broadcast of the event. There was still a sizable British Empire dominion and dependency when Elizabeth became monarch. Many of these colonies, however, gained their independence in the 1950s and 1960s, and the British Empire eventually morphed into the Commonwealth of Nations. So as head of the Commonwealth and representative of Britain, Elizabeth II traveled abroad, including a historic visit to Germany in 1965. When she arrived, she made history as the first British monarch to visit the country in over 50 years. What does this mean? let's break down did she actually have power I saw a lot of people on Twitter asking that and here are the six powers that I found interesting number one she can legitimize laws while Parliament has the authority to pass laws the Queen's approval is required for any legislation to take effect right number two she appoints ministers to the crown like prime ministers most government officials in the United Kingdom are chosen through a vote but the Queen can appoint ministers to the crown including advisors and cabinet officials her Self, so in a sense it's kind of like she's ruling through them if, if that makes sense number three she can pardon criminals much like American presidents and number four command the armed forces 
Mm. The Queen was in fact in charge of the entire British Armed Forces. Before joining the British Armed Forces, every potential recruit must take an oath to her, but with commanding any army comes the authority to delegate tasks within the military. Also, fifth, she can declare war. The Queen is the only person in the United Kingdom with the authority to declare war on other countries, but that doesn't mean she's invincible by any stretch of the imagination. This power is reserved for all-out warfare and it requires the approval of Parliament, the Prime Minister, and the rest of the government. And of course, she has never declared war or anything like that, okay? And six, she can avoid getting arrested. Although the public's perception and the stability of the monarchy may be affected by the Queen's actions, she is not in danger of being like, imprisoned or going to jail for them. She can't be tried as a result of her sovereign immunity. Elizabeth made tremendous efforts to preserve the monarchy's reputation and secure its future. After being hit by a series of blows, including death threats against the royal family, the once venerable institution has managed to weather the storm. Elizabeth had a close call of her own in June 1981 at the Trooping the Color, a special military parade held in her honor on the occasion of her official birthday. A man in the crowd pulled a weapon, which is a pistol, and pointed it at her. He took aim and fired, but his pistol was empty. The following year, an intruder broke into the Buckingham Palace and confronted Elizabeth in her bedroom, bringing the previous year's close call to nothing. Reporters began making assumptions about the health of the royal marriage after learning that Prince Philip had been notably missing during this incident. And I wanted to know, how do you sneak into a queen's palace? How? 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 How does an intruder do that? Where's the royal security? I, I, I don't understand. Now let's talk about Diana and the queen. So Charles, then 32, married Diana Spencer, then 19, and the couple had two children. Later rumors surfaced that Charles' family had pressured him into the marriage. And check out my Diana breakdown for more on that. It's linked in the end cards in the end screen. So massive crowds gathered in the streets of London to witness the nuptials and millions more watched the event unfold on television. Television, the public had a very positive view of the monarchy at that time and in 1982 and 1984 Elizabeth's grandsons were born to Charles and Diana. Elizabeth is now widely regarded as a doting grandmother by both William and Harry and Prince William had said that she was an enormous help to him and Kate Middleton as they planned their wedding in 2011. Elizabeth's son Charles and Diana's marriage made news for years well before cu the couple revealed their separation in 1992 and then filed for divorce in 1996. After Diana died in a car crash in Paris on August 31st 1997 the media focused closely on Elizabeth. Her former daughter-in-law was so well liked that she earned the title People's Princess and the Queen of Hearts. Elizabeth was harshly criticized for her lack of response after she remained silent for days as the country mourned Diana's death. It didn't help the Queen's popularity among the people when rumors spread that she had no intention of giving Diana a royal funeral. Elizabeth returned to London almost a week after Diana's death and made a public statement about the late princess. No secret that Elizabeth had initial reservations about Charles' romance with Camilla Parker Balls. So it's not like she liked Camilla. I don't think anyone liked Camilla, okay? But after breaking up initially due to pressure from Charles' family, Charles and Camilla renewed their relationships during his marriage to Diana. And we talk about Diana confronting Camilla and my Diana video breakdown also. So now let's get into why people dislike her. What's up with all the Twitter, right? The British monarchy is widely recognized as one of the world's most influential organizations. In most cases, the British royal family is singled out for criticism because of the widespread belief that their political system is authoritarian, extremely outdated and archaic and oppressive. Critics of the royal family often argue that the family is to blame for the perpetuation of existing economic and social gaps. Those who openly oppose the royal media and the royal family whether they be members of political parties or average citizens, did so because they saw the monarchy as a system based on oppression and inequality. The media's tendency to portray the British monarchy as a morality tale is a major contributor to this perception, as is its refusal to acknowledge how the public's adoration of the royal family contributes to the normalization of social inequality. Now, let's talk about the colonialism and imperialism, and this may get touchy. There were still 70 territories under British control when Elizabeth 
the first, her mother, assumed the throne. After the Bengal famine was made worse by British indifference, India only gained its independence five years before. The colonization of Africa was the European race to seize control of Africa's lands, people, and resources as quickly as possible, dividing tribes and families, hunting animals to extension, and stealing precious resources and art from African nations that they have yet to recover or be compensated for. Most of these territories are now ruled by the British. Some say Elizabeth had little to do with all of this because she was a young woman in her 20s and more of a political figurehead than a leader. In the first season of The Crown, she danced with the president of Ghana to ensure that the newly independent country would remain within the Commonwealth and not become a socialist or communist nation, proving that even as a figurehead, she was vital to portraying the image of England as a colonial power. Also, despite the fact that the term colony has been replaced by overseas territories, you know, to glamorize it, British colonialism is far from a thing of the past. Barbados only gained its independence last year. Last year. And I remember that. And many Jamaicans were outraged by William and Kate's visit, leading to a letter demanding restitution for 300 years as a slave colony. So many people are saying the royal family media plays everyone for fools also to see that many people here approve of the monarchy and their lifestyle you need only pursue the other responses the palace and the tabloids are to blame for this the glamorization of the monarch as they spread their royal propaganda they read an idealized glamorized portrayal of the royal family in the media one that is neither accurate nor fair but still believe it wholeheartedly in fact, one response here calls those who don't back the royal family envious or ignorant. So if you don't back them, even in Britain, you're either jealous of all their wealth or you're just ignorant. So you almost cannot criticize them. And even the people, they kind of like taken over the people to where the people will attack anyone who basically has any critic of the monarchy, arguing that it's wrong to give anything less than unwavering support to the royals. I saw many British articles that claim that the royal family also bribed political figures throughout the centuries. They use exemptions from the Freedom of Information Act to lobby po politicians secretly. They start chatting casually, become friends, invite them to tea, and keep in touch via phone calls and letters. In addition, they are required to remain politically neutral. And yeah, the royal family does this, the Pope, all of those, they do that. They like have all the leaders of the world meet with them and stuff and kind of have that influence that's been long known. But here's a little thing that kind of irritated me. Though they have a history of more racism, you know, I can't say certain things on YouTube, but the Guardian reported on June 2nd that the Queen's courtiers banned colored immigrants or foreigners from serving in clerical roles in the royal household until at least the late 1960s. According to newly discovered documents that will reignite the debate over the British royal family and race, and this is from David Pegg and Robin Evans, a lot of these things are now in the light and they're only going to continue to come in the light. I feel with her passing, more things will come in the light. A lot more things will come in the light. And I'm here for it. I'm sitting patiently watching like you guys, but comment below your thoughts. May she rest in peace. She got to see 13 presidents elected during her reign. She met with 14 presidents. She first met with Harry Truman in 1951 as a princess. She lived so long. She got to see so much, you know? And wow, I can only aspire to live that long. How do you guys feel with Charles? That's my last question I want to ask. How do you guys feel with Charles now finally going to be the king? He might live as long because their family lived long. They have a family that lives long, okay? And how do you guys feel with him finally? What irks me the most, I think, with the situation is that Camilla will finally be queen. That really upsets and grinds my gears. <laughs> It should have been Diana, right? Oh, it's so frustrating. But she finally got what she wanted. And may they have a great reign and peace be unto them. I love you guys so much. Thank you for tuning in. If you like the music you're listening to, the link is in the description. Support my brother. Like, comment, subscribe, and share. And check out my Princess Diana video. I love you guys so much. Thank you. Until next time.